Hello again everybody, my name is Josh Rhodes and you're listening to the Retro Monster Truck Review. This week we're talking about Bowling Green, Ohio, 1989, a turning point in the history of monster truck racing for sure, as we see a very early appearance from Taurus number 3, driven by Jack Wilman Jr. Joining me this week on the show is Matt Stoltz. Matt is an avid motorsports fan. He has a YouTube channel called Turn of the Century Motorsports that has just about all the content you could think of from old school racing goes. Uh, some old school NASCAR coverage on there. Some old school monster trucks. Pulling. Um, Mickey Thompson Tough Trucks. You name it. It's on that old YouTube channel of his. And you can watch some of the classic coverage of some of the classic sporting events of all time. You can also follow Matt on Facebook. He does a lot of RC racing as well. Matt Stoltz, RC Racing on Facebook. At the beginning of the show, I'd like to go ahead and address something that is very important to both myself and very important to Matt as well, and that is the fact that since this pandemic has started, it seems like that one of the things that has really suffered in this world is blood donation. And we both like to encourage you very much to please go out and donate some blood to your local American Red Cross and help save some lives. Without further ado, though, ladies and gentlemen, let's get right into it. Bowling Green, Ohio, 1989, here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. Retro Monster Truck Review here again with Matt Stoltz for uh, one of one of if not the most obscure kind of TNT events that happened in '89, but it's one that I wanted to touch on. Bowling Green, Ohio, uh, Wood County Fairgrounds. This is more known for being the World Championships in pulling, but in '89 they called in the monster trucks here, and it was a pretty good show, Matt. Yeah, I mean this is a show that I hadn't really watched for a number of years until. You know, we got talking about this, and it really turned out to be some good action and, and a show that I'm glad that I went back and took a second look at. Yeah, uh, same for me. Honestly, I've been kind of a little bit on a, a Taurus kick since doing the Cortland, Ohio episode with Chris Parrish here a little while back. Just watching the Wilmans and seeing how badly they wanted to win, it was kind of cool to go back and look at this event. Even though we don't see them until day two, it's still really cool to look back and see early Taurus 3, and this is a perfect example of early Taurus 3 right here. This may be one of the first pieces of video of this truck that had come out. Oh, for sure, yeah, and and they took no prisoners every time they brought that new truck out. Oh, yeah, very true, especially at this event. We'll get to Taurus 3 later, though. This event itself, Wood County Fairgrounds, known for probably the, the biggest world championship in polling for a very large number of years, still is to this day, since 1967. Uh, many people would probably consider this the Daytona 500 or the tractor pull uh, scene. Yeah, the largest outdoor tractor pull in the country. Uh, mm -hmm. It's run by, you know, a kind of a local slash state run organization is, is who promotes it. And they've brought in a variety of the main tours throughout the years, whether it be NTPA, U.S. Hot Rod, you know, did it for a while. TNT was involved, of course, and they bring in the best of the best every year out there in Ohio. Yep, and uh, just between you and me, we both know the RC world. The NRCTPA has done some exhibition pulling out here as well. Oh, yeah, they do a lot of, uh, you know, engagement, trying to get new people into it, getting people from the full-size world into the RC side of it. It matches up really well. Yeah, it does, and it's really cool to see when they build that scale RC pulling course out there near the actual track, and you get to see a crowd of people gathered around it. It's a pretty good little exhibition that they put on out there. I thoroughly enjoy seeing some highlights of it every now and then whenever some video pops up of it. Uh, but the pulling events out there have been second to none, really. They are some really cool ones to watch. If you ever get a chance to get on YouTube, find some videos of these pulling events. They are cool ones to watch. I'm not a big pulling guy, but I'll watch some Bowling Green stuff because I know they're throwing everything they've got at those trucks and tractors to try and pull off a win out there. And that's exactly what these guys do here for TNT Motorsports on this particular weekend. This is June 24th and 25th of 1989, and it was a very quick turnaround. This actually aired in July in uh, the 16th and 23rd, if I remember correctly, of 89. A very quick turnaround, something you don't see these days. And to be honest, something you didn't see much back then either. TNN did a pretty quick job of getting these shows turned around, and 
I'm not sure if it was because it was so early in the production run of Trucks and Tractor Power. You know, this is one of the earliest episodes that they did in the series. Mm -hmm. So they really did get these turned around in under a month, at least for the first week. Yeah, and I wish you could see that these days. If it were a perfect world, we'd be live. Monster Jam would be live every week, and you'd hear those those awesome live calls, which is what's made Monster Jam so good this season to watch on TV. And not to get on a, a rip of the current stuff, but you hear these live calls because they've got the live announcers right there. I wish that would have probably helped out this broadcast a little bit for some of the calls that we hear later. But it's really cool that we get this turnaround that we've got right here. Uh, it's a little less than a month we get this on air. It's still fresh in people's minds that we're there. It's cool, and I just I really enjoy how fast this gets pumped out here for Trucks and Tractor Power for the air date. Yeah, and you know it's interesting. We have Trucks and Tractor Power, kind of the newcomer on the block, uh, coming in in 1989 on TNN, a cable channel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, TNT really was going after the TV networks for their product. They had Tough Tracks, which was syndicated, and it had started kind of around the same time. I think the earliest listings I could find were for around May or so mm -hmm. for syndication, the first run of Tough Tracks. Then they kind of repackaged the show with the Gloob sponsorship and started re-airing it again. I think in September they uh, went back and re-edited some of the original shows. You had Power Tracks on ESPN, which was your standard. Uh, it transitioned into the Monster Truck Challenge late in 1989, and then Trucks and Tractor Power, all three of these shows covering TNT action. Yeah, and multiple shows as well. I mean, sometimes you would capture TNT getting covered, uh, the same show on a particular weekend being covered by Tough Tracks and Power Tracks and Trucks and Tractor Power every now and then. Yeah, sometimes you got all three in one. Usually at least two out of the three would be covering an event, but in this case, Trucks and Tractor Power is the only one that gets the Bowling Green broadcast. Yeah, and one constant I want to point out there, too, as far as Tough Tracks, Power Tracks, Truck and Tractor Power, Army Armstrong. Well, later on. Later on, see yes. Much, yeah, later on, see he, was always a, he seemed to be like a constant as far as the series would go. He was always broadcasting Trucks and Tractor Power, Power Tracks, Tough Tracks. Here, though, it's a different lineup of guys, and I actually kind of I kind of like this lineup of guys that we have calling those. Now. You know, it's it's a little bit of a different crew. We've got some folks coming in from other industries and television. You know, Stan Rhodes is our host. He mm -hmm. is uh, a guy that's been in TV, I found out, for quite a long time, over 30 years in the media business. He's centered mostly around Tampa, Florida, it seems. And not only was he a TV on-air personality, but also a camera operator, I found out. He was has worked in NHL, NFL, MLB. He worked on Nickelodeon Guts. And uh, he, he did a lot of different work on TV throughout the years. But in terms of monster truck coverage, just about a half a season of trucks and tractor power. And he'd be replaced by Gary Lee by the end of 1989. Yep, very true. But second here on the, the chart as far as broadcasters go, Rich Hoosier, one of my favorite Bigfoot drivers from back in the day. He finished second place, of course, in the TNT points in the year before in Bigfoot number four. Uh, he would leave the show in mid-1990, though, and be replaced by Army Armstrong. But still, Rich Hoosier did an excellent job, I always thought, on these shows to cover this trucks and tractor power stuff. I mean, he was a very good voice to have in there. He had the voice of experience, and you can hear that in this broadcast. Rich Rich did an all right job, I feel. Um, he, he made a few errors that we'll get to here later in the broadcast that I kind of scratched my head at a little bit. But uh, overall, you know, he, he really was able to take his monster truck knowledge and still expand it into the truck and tractor pulling in the mud bog events as well, which not a lot of guys can do. Yep, very true. Um, we'll get into the next guy here, the pit reporter, Mr. Mike Goss. Somebody who, um, in my opinion, I never really did enjoy some of his stuff. I mean, he just, he had that the bland tone. But here he does really good. I really enjoy his performance here on this Trucks and Tractor Power episode. I think he does a very good job speaking very well for himself in this particular show. Yeah, Mike was more of a behind-the-scenes guy. He worked on all three of those series that we mentioned earlier. Yeah, and, and you he, see his name in the credits for all three of these series. Yeah, anything involved with TNT on television, and, and Mike was kind of the ringleader behind the scenes from what I understand. And in this case, he, he gets in front of the camera a little bit, and we see him again on Tough Tracks later in 1990 as well. But in Trucks and Tractor Power, he is the main pit reporter. Yep. Uh, this show airs on TNN, by the way, and I always, I thought it was funny, the little note that you put in here for your notes. <laughs> the, yeah. the TNN logo. 
Yeah, so if you look at the TNN logo, it says TNN, the Nashville Network, and to the left of it, there's a silhouette of a guitar head on like a, an orange or red background. Now, when I was a kid growing up in the very early 90s, we didn't watch TNN for music coverage or any of the stuff that's around the country music world. We watched it for motorsports. We were watching exactly. Inside Winston Cup, NASCAR Racing, Trucks and Tractor Power, American Sports Cavalcade, all those shows. And growing up, you know, your mind as a kid relates things a certain way. I always saw the TNN logo as a drag racing Christmas tree. Yeah, and I didn't see it until I actually saw the logo again. I was like, you know what? That actually does kind of look like a pro tree. <laughs> Yeah, you know, as as a three or four year old just watching TV, you think, oh, well, that's what I'm seeing on TV every week. That's why it's there. And I still have trouble differentiating that in my mind today, even though I'm much older now. We go on to the show one lineup here. And uh, of course, USA One, Rod Litzow, always a hard charger. I'm fortunate, though, that it appears a timing chain issue with USA One will keep them out of show number one, but they're still listed in here and they are talked about. Uh, we go to Awesome Kong, Steve Kane, probably the fastest truck in this lineup outside of USA One until we get to Wild Hair, of all people, with Bob Breen behind the wheel. Just put in a new blower motor, and before this, there is a highlight shown on, I believe it's the Lima, Ohio episode, where you see Bob Breen just flat spank the field with this new blower motor, and the, the biggest highlight is defeating USA One. He straight up beat Rod Litzow in USA 1 in Pueblo on, the I think it was the second night, and he just put a perfect run together, and, and you see that aggression come through into Bowling Green. You absolutely yeah. do with Wild Hair and Bob Breen. Mr. Twister, David Christensen, one of my favorite paint jobs and just one of my favorite looks of a truck from back in the late 80s. Love the Mr. Twister truck. King Crunch debuts here with a brand new truck for 89 in Bowling Green. This is, of course, what's going to go on to be auto value King Crunch down the road. This truck was built actually as a mix between USA One and Gravedigger or any other truck that had a mid engine design. If you look at the truck from the side sitting next to USA One, you understand the geometry as far as the suspension was set up, the wheelbase, the wheel width of this truck, but the rear engine is what really helped this truck out, I think, weight-wise and really helped drop the uh, center of gravity for this truck as well. Also, full fiberglass body on this King Crunch. Yeah, the truck flew really well. It was very well balanced, and later on on Tough Tracks, they would get into the, you know, King Crunch's computer controlled, and that was a bit of a stretch. They weren't really computer controlling the truck. They did have a lot of diagnostic equipment from Autometer on the truck that allowed them to, you know, get readings and stuff. Uh, some of the stuff the Bigfoot team would use later on in the Penda series. Uh, Scott Stevens, I think it was on Scott Douglas' podcast, was talking about some of the technology they had there in the truck. And it was really groundbreaking for the time, but it wasn't like some kind of RoboCop, Cybermorph, you know, computer-controlled machine like they made it out to be. Oh, yeah, they made it out to be. They also, the radio communication was another thing that they always made big on uh, the King Crunch truck as well. We move on, though. We go to Mad Dog John Breen, always a truck that is very consistent in TNT. Stomper, uh, I've always had my issues with the way this truck was promoted. I know TNT owned it, but at the same time, Stomper never really stood up to the hype as far as I was concerned. But I always did love Marvin Smith. The man could talk on the microphone. I just love Marvin. Marvin always looked at the bright side of things. Anytime you see him in an interview, he's always smiling. No matter what went wrong, he's got a smile on his face and probably not a bad outlook for the rest of us to take, honestly. Yeah, very true. That's why I always like Marvin. He always had a positive outlook on things, no matter how bleak the outcome was. No problem. John Moore, one of the, again, perennial con competitors here in TN TNT. Enjoy always watching the No Problem Ford Bronco. And then another kind of a newcomer to TNT here, Mike Vodders, 24 years old in Black Stallion. Beautiful looking truck, by the way. It's an exhibition style truck at this point, not really made for racing. But I think he does a fair showing of himself here at this broadcast. Yeah, Mike, I'm not sure how much he actually ran with TNT. Obviously not a lot on television, but he's got the 88 front clip on the truck at this point. But it's really still, for the most part, the exhibition show truck that he was running prior still a very heavy very not not quite horsepower up there with uh everybody else kind of truck as far as i'm concerned with black stallion 
Yeah, he'd really step his program up a couple years later, like in 1991. He starts getting on pace with the rest of the field on the racetrack. Carolina Crusher 2, Gary Porter, nothing else needs to be said right there. The Mark Martin of Monster Truck Racing, Mr. Consistency as always. Dave Wysorek and Nightlife rounds out your lineup for day number one here. Nightlife 2, another extremely consistent truck. It's just he ended up always, it seems like he always ended up lining up against the guys that were just that little bit quicker than him. Yeah, it's it's tough. You know, the way that TNT said their brackets, Dave would always be like, you know, maybe fourth, fifth, sixth in the lineup, but that gave us often a bad draw. Yeah, and it was always unfortunate for Wysorek, though he did find victory lane at the Houston Astrodome once. Yeah, Dave, it seemed like he would always make it to, you know, at least out of the first round into the semifinals somewhere in there. He really did a good job and never really tore up the truck, which is the most impressive. Oh, yeah. He was always one of the guys that seemed to always load his truck on the trailer, make some money out of the weekend. Yeah, and he still does it today with the two uh, robots that he's got, Galactron and Reptar. He's still out there campaigning those things. Track that we have here is a very long course, 270 feet track, 200, or excuse me, two sets of cars, uh, 40, to the fir- 40 feet to the first eight car jump, 130 feet between the 12 car jump here. So a very long no man's land to build up plenty of speed, a uh, long run to the ramp. As you've said in your notes, compared to West Lebanon, it's pretty close to that same style of track. It's a long stretch, and we'll see as we go through the broadcast here, some of these trucks just play and run out of gearing. As we said earlier, USA1 is in attendance here, but they did have some uh, tough luck with the engine timing chain issues before qualifying, never made it out on the track. Uh, The way they make it seem here is they just missed the call, which was like a five-minute clock to make it out there. Tough break for Rod Litzow, and honestly, a tough break for the crowd, too, because that's one truck that you really would want to perform out here, especially on this first day. Rod's always one of those guys. If if just going to send it was a phrase back in 1989, that would have been on the back of Rod Litzow's driving suit. Yeah, and, you know, I, I've been hearing the phrase more often now about Rod. You know, the guy was so intense, and he never smiled. And I never re- noticed that until I started going back and watching these shows and these interviews. Rod was a very, very intense competitor. He never wanted to make it, you know, known that his truck was going to give up, and he was always going to put the foot to the floor, go after it all the time. Kind of puts me in the mind of Paul Menard just a little bit. Have you ever watched a Paul Menard interview? The man never really smiled. He was always straight on, consistent when he spoke. And then, of course, I'm talking about the NASCAR driver, Paul Menard. Uh, another guy that comes to mind is Carl Edwards, old crew chief. I want to say Osborne was his last name. I can't think of it off the top of my head. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting character. You know, we have a lot of different personalities in the monster truck world. And let's all almost kind of like, Well, I mean, he was the hired gun to go in Mm -hmm. there like a mercenary, get the job done, no emotion, turn around, go do it again. That was Rod's goal every time he went on the racetrack. Yep, very true. We go into round one racing here. Awesome Kong and Mr. Twister. Awesome Kong. Going to have lane choice the entire night. Number one qualifier. Like I said, always love the look of Mr. Twister here, but honestly, it's outclassed against that awesome Kong truck in the far lane over there. The left lane is going to become the lane that is the most dominant on the weekend. And, I mean, when you're the fastest qualifier and you have lane choice the entire night, it's obvious which lane you're going to go to here. Uh, fairly close race, though, given Mr. Twister is not a race truck. Yeah, I mean, Dave Christensen really pushes the truck hard, and the thing had a short little wheelbase. I think it was a short bed Ford pickup, actually. It wasn't a long bed, so the thing was really short, kind of got a little bit out of shape in the air every time he got that thing you know, off the second ramp, but he gave it a good effort for being you know, such an outdated truck compared to the competition. Yeah, it might have been an outdated truck, but like I said, the truck, it, it just seems like it had a, a really good top end gear in it. I mean, it proves at the end of the track here, he was running down Awesome Kong, even though I think Kong kind of knew he was ahead at that point and he kind of laid off the throttle a little bit. I mean, Christensen's really putting the pedal to the metal as far as I'm concerned, trying to catch back up to him. Oh, yeah. I mean, making up time in a hurry. And it's kind of a trend that we'll see throughout the entire weekend is – you know, that second jump is a little bit steep. And if you're ahead, it seems like the guys are taking it a little easy. And that other lane is going to try to come back in a big way because the other guy's flooring it. Yeah. And the, the interview with Steve Kane at the end of the race pretty much says it all here. I mean, it says that the second ramp out there is very steep for these guys. And when you look at the video, you can see that it actually is. They're launching pretty far out there on those 12 cars. 
yeah, especially you see it with Mr. Twister here. He he clears a good portion of them, and uh, you know that's a little bit of foreshadowing for the next race. It gets even more crazy. Oh yeah, we got Wild Hair and King Crunch, and man, let me tell you, Wild Hair with that new motor in it seems to have woken that truck up. And when I say woke that truck up, I mean added some nos to the thing because <laughs> wild hair in my opinion way back in the day when i would watch these shows i never really knew about this this stretch where they had this big motor in the truck i never even thought it would ever make it out of the first or second round sometimes you would watch the motor mat you'd watch some of these shows and you would just see breen would be out first or second he was a character don't get me wrong when they'd interview him you could always i love the grin that he always had on his face when they talked to john or excuse me bob after the race was over with however it never really ever seemed to make it out of the first or second round. And a lot of those times, it wasn't that he didn't make it out of the round. It was due to breakage. You know, he would win, and then you just never see him again. I went back and, and watched a good portion of this midseason run, you know, in preparation for, for our discussion here. And they only had this engine in the truck maybe about a month and a half, it looks like, or so. And... You know, they blow the engine up in New York, and they can't finish out the mini tour. And then later on, we see the truck with the junkyard engine, famously, you know, that they pulled out of a car. And it's just like a 454 with a, a single barrel carb on it. And the truck gets down the track, but it definitely isn't as competitive anymore. Yeah, it's not as competitive, unfortunately, after that. And it's a shame because Bob Breen, in, in this little stretch right here where they've got this big blower motor in the truck... He seems to be one of the ones to beat. He has the highest horsepower, I would say, of anybody there personally. I mean, the truck just it seems to flat out work, and he proves it here taking on King Crunch. I mean, they absolutely are going for it on this race. It's one of the better races of the weekend, I feel. They both hit that second jump wide open, and it's no surprise that uh, Bob Breen is Dave Grimm's favorite driver. You see it here. <laughs> Bob Breen, Bob Breen, Bob Breen, John Breen. No, anyway. <laughs> We, sc we scroll on here, though. Uh, to me, it looked like King Crunch kind of stumbled a little bit on the line, and that allowed Wild Hair, as they got into No Man's Land, to just kind of slowly pull away from uh, King Crunch. Yeah, you see him coming off the first set of cars. King Crunch is still a little bit stiff. Again, first show out for a brand new truck, and they'll get the suspension dialed in throughout the rest of the season, and the stiff suspension actually helps him in some places. And, you know, Nashville, he ends up taking up a win by kind of bouncing through the course the right way. But Wild Hair gets the win here and uh, moves on to the next round. It's in this race, though, that I kind of see a development going on in that right lane. It seems like, like I said, Crunch stumbles off the line. But you're seeing it's almost like he's blowing the tires off a little bit, which is a term that you would hear maybe in drag racing as well, where a, a car spins off the line a little bit. And it's, it's starting to develop right here in that right lane, and I think that's what's causing guys a lot of trouble over that first set of cars. Yeah, they're not getting a great launch in that right lane, and then additionally, you've got – kind of a, a hole developing at the end of that first set of cars in the right lane. It's kind of throwing the guys up in the air coming off rather than giving a smooth transition down to get into no man's land, put the power down. That seems to be where the difference is here in the lanes. Yeah, depending on where you land in that first sack, you're either going to hit your right front into it or you're going to hit your left or excuse, your right rear into it. And it's going to cause you to bounce up or it's going to cause you to bounce in the rear of the truck. And it's not going to be a very good setup for down the straightaway in no man's. Yeah, and with such a long run to that second set of cars, any difference that you have is really going to you know, show itself by the time you get to the end of that straightaway. Mad Dog and Stomper here. Uh, first thing I noticed when they show the close-up here, Breen Boys Racing Oys <laughs> on the front of Mad Dog. They, their T is apparently gone in toys on the very uh, – they have that – the front of the cab there, right in front of where John would sit, they have that Breen's Boys Racing Toys across there with that little shield right there, and the T is gone. And I thought that was kind of funny that they didn't put the T there, at least try to Sharpie it on there. Well, you know, 1989, I guess a vinyl guy was hard to come by back then. Hey, yeah, you never know. I mean, there weren't 60 companies out there like there are now. Yeah, we're taking a look here. You know, Stomper kind of gets a little bit of an open... You know, whole shot here going off the first set of cars. You know, there's a lot of back and forth in this race. Yes. You know, Mad Dog leaves the line first, but Stomper really kind of takes, you know, the the lead coming off that first set of cars again as we see Mad Dog bounces off. And, you know, they're both trying to correct left and right through No Man's Land. And, you know, again, it comes back to that right lane. That first set of cars really gets Mad Dog out of shape. 
Yeah, first set of cars really hurt Mad Dog the worst here. It was kind of the battle of who could recover the quickest, and that was Marvin Smith and Stomper, and Stomper goes on to take the win. Yeah, and then after the finish line, the race isn't over yet. They're still trying to get things shut down, and Breen goes over to the right side and just narrowly admits the remote camera position uh, up on a scissor lift, and the guys on the broadcast kind of lose their mind for a second, you know, worrying they're going to get taken out, uh, even though they're not actually in that camera position. But it's uh, it's a bit of a close call. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was – I mean, you could probably fit half a car length between his right front tire – and that scissor lift, Breen, he almost reacts just a little bit late to it. If you watch the video, as soon as he sees it, he's just, oh, he quickly steers to the left to avoid it. But it seems like he reacts just a little bit late because he doesn't know how close he is over there. Yeah, it looks like he's trying to get the truck shut down, do a lot of things at the same time. And, uh, you know, there is a guardrail there kind of helping to protect that camera position, but it wouldn't stand up much to a monster truck. No, and honestly, that scissor lift is probably just a little bit too close to that guardrail anyway. They could have backed that up maybe – two or three more feet and it had probably been okay had mad dog connected because the truck would have bounced back to the left and into the infield instead of hitting the guardrail guardrail and possibly taking out that scissor lift but thankfully we don't have to worry about any of that because it didn't happen this is still pretty early on in the mtra's development of, of safety standards you know we're talking mm-hmm. mid 1989 here so tnt being a member of mtra i'm sure was helping them develop some of these you know, safety standards and such. And later on throughout the rest of the season, you see most of the TV cameras are a little bit further removed from the track. So maybe they did learn something here. Yeah, maybe they did. I mean, it's, it's always a learning experience out there for a lot of different motorsports when they're first starting out. And this is definitely one of those situations where they were probably sitting in the back going, you know what, maybe we ought to scoot that back just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's something, you know, we learn all the time in monster truck, events and and what to do and what not to do and this is the infancy of the safety side of it back here again you mtra really only out for maybe a year and a half two years at that point uh, in terms of its initial development they were really really growing during this time and uh you know we, the whole industry's benefited from it no problem in black stallion here as we said earlier 24 year old baby face mike vodders one of the few times we see him in tnt tv action he's gonna be taking on a tnt veteran here with john moore and no problem probably the shortest wheelbase truck on the tnt tour throughout 88 90 and excuse me 88 89 and 90 uh two truck length victory though here for no problem i mean just kind of a case of getting out motored honestly this is a former bigfoot engine inside no problem right here and it really shows because the truck just gets down from point a to point b extremely quick yeah rich has given us you know the inside information being a former member of the bigfoot team saying hey no plot problems got an old bigfoot engine in there and and the truck really does run well for as as short and you know disadvantaged as john was in terms of the setup of the truck he really puts a good run together and he was always known at least according to the announcers as being really good on the turning courses but some of his brightest moments in tnt were on the long straight line tracks yeah i mean no problem is no slouch i mean the truck would go out there and it would pull off an upset every now and then you would see no problem occasionally take out gravedigger you'd see it occasionally take out bigfoot usa one Every now and then, when John Moore was on his game, he was a guy not to be messed with on the track. And this seemed to be one of those nights. Yeah, John's looking good. He's getting the whole shot, you know, which obviously will help you out in any race. And he's got that good lane. Oh, yeah. That left lane is the big advantage right here. Going into the next race, though, Carolina Crusher and Nightlife. Lane choice, obviously, a factor here. Carolina Crusher kind of revealed here is probably the number two qualifier. It's not really known. Uh, They don't really give us the full rundown of the bracket and how it shakes out. But Carolina Crusher, obviously, left lane taking on nightlife. Rich says the matchup here is between long wheelbase and short wheelbase. But when you look at these two trucks, there is not much of a difference there at all. Yeah, I mean, Carolina Crusher is a little longer, but probably no more than eight or ten inches longer on wheelbase than nightlife is. And that kind of threw me for a loop, you know, Rich saying that. it uh, They don't look all that different to me. maybe forgot he forgot to mention the long and short wheelbase in the previous round, and he wanted to get it in here. I don't know why. It's, it's just an odd call to me. Yeah, it's a little bit strange. I don't get it. But, I mean, you know, Crusher gets that lead coming off that first set again, and we we talked about it earlier. 
he kind of takes it easy over the second set of cars. Nightlife makes up a ton of time as a result, you know, going for it. Uh, just comes up about a tire length short. And you would see this out of Gary Porter every now and then. When he thought he had a lead, he'd essentially back out just a little bit. And there were a couple of times it cost him a victory. And this was almost one of those times. Dave Wysorek had the top end speed to keep up with Gary Porter, and he showed it in this race. Yeah, you know, obstacle course elimination racing, the goal is to win. It doesn't really matter by how much. And back then, these guys are just trying to keep their trucks together. You don't want to push in any harder than you have to. So uh, a lot of the guys, if you got a a good lead, you, you back off a little bit. But, you know, like you said, sometimes that'll come back to bite you if you're not careful. For for, uh, Gary, the biggest one I can remember is against Clydesdale at Louisville Motor Speedway. All of a sudden, you think Gary Porter is just going to go on and cruise to victory, and then here comes Bennett Clark charging out of nowhere to steal one from Gary. Yeah, I mean, that was a huge jump from Clydesdale and Louisville. You know, on the outside lane, uh, nobody thought it could be done, I guess, at the time. They were still learning that track, and you figure if you go into that second turn with a lead— and you're on the inside, you've got the race one, you could take it easy, but uh, Ben had put the, the pedal through the floorboard coming up to that final jump, and he about got into the wall at the end of the track. He barely got that truck shut down uh, you know, for as hard as he was running, and Gary was taking it easy. And then if I remember right, he said, you know, I'll never back down like that again. Yeah, yeah, very true. And Porter, from that point on, I don't think he ever really did, but here is one of those instances in this race where you can kind of see Gary kind of saving the equipment just a little bit, and it comes back to almost bite him because Dave Wysorek is somebody you don't necessarily want to do that against. Right, and and you never sleep on Dave Wysorek. Again, he was always competitive, always had his equipment together, so even if he lost, he was probably going to come back maybe as a fast loser, or if somebody breaks, he's going to slide right back in the program and – his stuff's going to be fresh and ready to go every time. Round number two starts right here. Awesome Kong and Wild Hair. Very slight hole shot to Wild Hair, but I want to point out Wild Hair's in that right lane. You may have a big motor here, but that right lane is to a little bit of a disadvantage. However, Breen's truck soaks this right lane up here. I think the little bit of extra horsepower that he has propels him past that hole in the cars and that's what really gives him a shot here in this race and he eventually goes on to steal the win from the number one qualifier yeah we see wild hair again coming right over that hump in the cars or that hole i should say gets on the down ramp nice and smooth and boy it's a drag race to that second set of cars and wild hair it's got to be one of the bigger leaps of the year i mean in terms of distance not quite as much but he's high up there he's very high up there and it's an impress it's an impressive leap for a couple of reasons number one the height number two the distance number three the fact that the drive shaft literally explodes out of the front of this truck you see sparks and you see drive shaft and pieces falling from underneath wild hair here unfortunate that it's going to put him out for the rest of the night but at the same time you just went out there and spanked the number one qualifier he got the job done, but he paid the price for it. You know, it's it's a huge jump, and we'll kind of see the same thing a year later in Bowling Green with King Kong making huge leaps, but shelling the drivetrain out of the truck. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a testament to these guys wanting to go out and win. And, you know, Bob Breen, not used to having that much power and, and still getting used to this new engine, he's he's not taking it easy on the truck. When you I see feel, the slow uh, – go ahead. I was going to say this, I feel this is one of the races of the year, honestly. Um, I I call it an absolute hidden gem. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the commentary doesn't quite match up with the action going on on the screen here. Yeah, they don't really put any excitement into it. And this is something that I touched on in the last episode that we spoke with Colby Marshall on on the uh, Cleveland event that we covered. It just seems like there was there's little to no emotion shown here. They do a very good job of keeping it a serious kind of a conversation of a race that had just happened but i mean for as close as this race was you would think you would hear a little bit of an increase into the voice there as they come across the finish line but you don't get that if scott and army are on this call we'd all remember it a lot more yes i i 100 agree with you there uh one thing that i want to point out here is in the slow motion i noticed two things first how awesome the slow-mo is of the drive shaft coming out from underneath wild hair the sparks that come out, the drive shaft itself falling out. Secondly, if you really look closely at that finish line, it's a wonder as to who actually really won the race. They call Wild Hair the winner, 
But to me, just looking at it in the far lane there, it almost looks like Kong is maybe two, three inches ahead at most. The 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 camera choice that we have here for the, the slow-mo is great to show the action in the near lane closest to us, but it doesn't necessarily show us the finish line and who is actually ahead at that point. Yeah, it's a hard call. Um, you know, TNT always had a timing tape camera set yeah. up right at the finish line, but not often did we get to see it, and they didn't use it for video feed for the television production. So uh, it was tough to tell, and I've seen some angles where the TV, it looks like one guy wins, but they show that finish line camera, and it's it's the other guy that wins. Uh, you know, I'm sure this was a very, very close race. I don't think that they really gave an interval on the win here, but I think they were running a 60 frame per second camera, so they were in point you know, three thousand, three hundredths of a second increments on the finish, and uh, I, Wild Hair must have just got him at the line. I'm guessing. Yeah, according to uh, what the TNT timing tape said, that's probably what happened there. But like I said, unfortunately, we don't get to see it. We get the angle that TV has, and it's not necessarily the best angle. Uh, and that's going to prove to be a dividend later on, too, because there are several close races here this weekend, and this is just the first one where you're kind of scratching your head as far as what the winner goes. Yeah, I mean, the racing was that close, and like I said, this is kind of a hidden gem uh, in terms of the whole weekend. You know, I've had this, you know, video for probably 15 years and maybe only watched it once or twice, and like I said before, I go back to watch it for, for our discussion here, and it really, really impresses me with the amount of action going on. Yeah, it's well, it's a sleeper event. It really is. You talk about that race being a sleeper. This is actually what I would consider to be one of the bigger sleeper events of the 89 season. The length of the track, the speed of the trucks, the amount that some guys that you wouldn't necessarily think would push their trucks are pushing their trucks. It's it's a sleeper weekend. It really is. Yeah, a lot of times with TNT, if they'd have multiple events in one weekend, obviously they'd have to split their regulars and, and bring in some other guys. And this was the case here. TNT also running an event in Foxborough at Sullivan Stadium that weekend with Gravedigger and, and Equalizer and some of the other top trucks. So you get some what we would think would be filler in the lineup, but those guys really run hard. Speaking of hard runners, we get Mr. Christensen back here and Mr. Twister, third quickest loser, going to be taking on Stomper. Another very close race between these guys right here. And it's, again, one of those ones where you're looking at the finish line camera that we get, and you're almost scratching your head just a little bit. Margin of victory, though, is actually said here at .03 for Stomper. Yeah, that's one tick of the camera tape as far as I'm concerned. It's uh, a very, very close race again. And I, I don't know how Christensen manages to keep the truck in check because it flies nice and level but boy that thing recoiled really really bad coming off the second set of cars and any worse and that thing could have went end over end yeah very true i mean that was a hell of a rebound that that truck got he was definitely pushing it extremely hard shows the top end speed that the truck has uh, Stomper just kind of very lucky to be able to keep the truck under control. It was a little bit squirrely in no man's land, and that's what really allows Mr. Twister to catch up right here. And Marvin Smith sneaks out a victory over a truck that a lot of people probably thought wasn't going to be as competitive going into this weekend. But there are some really hard passes here from Christensen. Oh, for sure. And, you know, we, we get to uh, Mike Goss here with Marvin Smith after the race. Marvin, smiling as usual. And, uh, you know, a shout out to his sponsor, I guess, for the weekend, Transmissions to Go on his hat there in the pit area. Well, it was usually the case for Stomper. Where the transmission would go, they would have to get another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, you place yourself around the right people who you need, right? Yeah, exactly. There you go. Uh, Nightlife, Fast Loser are going to be taking on Carolina Crusher here. Rematch of round one. For some strange reason, they again go back to the wheelbase discussion. Like you said, there's maybe 10 inches between these two trucks as far as wheelbase goes. Not really much of a difference at all. Nightlife, though, bounces extremely hard after the first set and kind of just hands the win to Gary here this time. Yeah, I mean, not to say it's a complete repeat of round one. The, the race is a little bit you know, less contested overall, but Nightlife doesn't get that good bounce again over that first set of cars, and, and it's pretty much over from there. No problem in King Crunch right here. King Crunch, second fastest loser. No problem is going to get the whole shot, but he tops out, his gearing tops out pretty early, and King Crunch flies past him. But in this race, one thing I need to point out is it sounds like to me King Crunch is just revving straight to the moon mid track. Sounds like there's transmission issues going on there with Scott Stevens. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's issues on both sides. You hear no problem 
through no man's land, you hear his engine top out. He's running full RPM, can't go no faster. And then King Crunch comes flying in with, again, a pretty good leap. But it seems as though maybe he wasn't getting that thing all the way into high gear. It's either he's not getting in a high gear or the transmission itself is just not cooperating at all with the truck. Maybe a torque converter issue as well. Uh, the truck just doesn't seem to want to go. And one thing I do want to point out as well is the interview afterwards. And Steven says they put a lot of time into this one truck. In 88, you saw several different King Crunches throughout that entire season. And this time in 89, they focused on building this one truck and making it as straight as they could possibly make it. And it shows they put a lot of effort into it here. And now they're going to go into the semifinals. Yeah, you know, Scott joins, you know, mid-season here. Um, not really, I guess, interested in the points race, but wants to go out and win races, wants to, you know, show that he's top dog on the on the TNT Monster Truck Challenge. Uh, we would see another team take some time off that Scott would end up complaining about. Um, pot. Kettle black. Yeah, maybe just a little bit there. Uh, one thing that jumps into my head, and, and this happens a lot in our RC racing world um, as far as point series goes. Stevens joins here mid season with a truck that a lot of people would probably consider to be a points contender for 89 had he gotten it completed earlier in the season. Uh, does he necessarily give away what that truck is capable of, capable of doing by joining mid season here? Yeah, I mean, he goes out, he wins a couple races by the end of the season. The truck's definitely competitive. I'd say it's probably a top four truck in mm -hmm. the series, regardless of, of who's in or out due to breakage. Um, you know, you've got Equalizer, USA One, Carolina Crusher, Gravedigger, and King Crunch would be that fifth, I guess, then, uh, in terms of anybody going out and winning any night on TNT Monster Truck Challenge. Yeah, yeah, I hear, I hear you there. Uh, one one cool thing to note here is both Scott and this event are sponsored by Coors Beer. I didn't even really notice this until you had put it in your notes. Uh, Coors was heavily involved with uh, the USA Motorsports Series, but it's kind of interesting to see him here with TNT. I'm assuming that this was a local Coors sponsorship for this event. I'm guessing so because I can't recall any beer sponsors at TNT events in terms of signage uh, at any of the other events. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking it's probably some kind of local regional deal as well. You put this in your notes here. As we go to commercial break, we get a guy sitting in the stands. He's wearing a Barefoot Tracks T-shirt. You found that interesting. Uh, it's a little bit later that I noticed in the second broadcast, and I'm just I'm going to go ahead and bring this up now because this happens to be in the notes. Uh, there is a shot of right before they go to commercial of a kid wearing a Bigfoot shirt, standing directly next to a kid wearing a Gravedigger shirt. I, I don't understand these shots. I really don't because neither, all three of these trucks, whether it's the tank truck, Bigfoot, or Gravedigger, none of those trucks are here, but they're getting promoted on a TNT broadcast. Yeah, Barefoot uh, came to Ohio a lot via... USA Motorsports events and mm -hmm. a lot of World of Wheels displays throughout the 80s. Um, so I'm not sure if, you know, I'm sure this guy had been to other monster truck shows, probably got the shirt there. Uh, the Bigfoot and Gravedigger, I can understand a little bit more because the uh, merchandising, a lot of it was handled through TNT at the time. Yeah. Uh, they had their own shirts for Bigfoot and Gravedigger in addition to the teams having their own stuff. So they probably had that stuff at the merch stand, and obviously— They did. They did. That was my next point, is they actually do show a short clip of a merchandise stand shortly after uh, these two kids are shown in the stands on the second show. And you do see a lot of Bigfoot merchandise in there. The most notably one that I saw was Bigfoot Fast Tracks t-shirt that was in there. Uh, it's just—it's weird to me, though, that you have these trucks on this show— but you don't promote any of their merchandise. You promote the trucks that aren't here. Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting take for sure. It's you know merchandising. The weird one is the, the, weird one is the barefoot because we never saw a barefoot in TNT. Well, yeah, I'm, the way I'm thinking about it is, you know, this is probably a new film crew for the most part. I, I was doing some digging trying to figure out who actually produced these early trucks and tractor power events because you don't see a Diamond P logo. At the end of this broadcast, you see a company called, I think it was called VSEP. 
Mm -hmm. And I unfortunately couldn't find anything out about them, but they ran their logo on trucks and tractor power through the end of 1990, I think it was at least. Uh, But we know that Diamond Peak cameras were on site for a lot of the stuff in 1990, so I'm not sure how that worked out, but I'm guessing that whatever remote, you know, facility unit they were using, they probably just said, hey, get pictures of, you know, people in the stands, some B-roll of of people wearing monster truck stuff, and that's what it was at the time. Uh, I'm sure that if they knew that, you know, two nerds would be sitting picking it apart 32 years later that they'd have probably made a different choice. Yes, they should have. They should have known <laughs> that this was coming. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I just thought it was weird that they're going to promote the the different shirts, especially the barefoot one. I found that odd. But anyway, we scroll into the semifinals here and we see Awesome Kong and Stomper. To me, this is a no brainer as to who's going to win this race. Awesome Kong comes back because, excuse me, it comes back due to Wild Hair's breakage. The break rule is in effect here. The interesting thing that I found here, though, Awesome Kong, yes, your number one qualifier, however, lost the previous round, but comes back and still gets lane choice. Yeah, I mean, that's the TNT rule at the time is that the higher qualifier gets lane choice, I guess, regardless. Um, We wouldn't see individual timed you know, lane choice determinations until the Penda days where they had their, their timing system running, you know, all the time. So, uh, Hey, higher qualifier, you still get lane choice, even if you're coming back through the loser bracket. Yep. And awesome Kong just leaves stomper over the first set of cars and never looks back full car set distance victory right here. That's 12 cars that awesome Kong just soared past stomper on. I mean, uh, if this was a call back in late 88, I always go back to this. Awesome Kong wins by a country mile. Yeah, and you know, not to to speak ill of of Marvin at all. He he ran good all night for the most part, but he he kind of falls flat in the the semifinals. Yeah, he doesn't get the bounce. And let's be honest, Awesome Kong is one of the fastest trucks on the tour in terms of top end speed. Maybe the fastest truck with planetaries at the time. You know, USA won obviously the the highest because he's got the gear ratio advantage through the axles. Mm -hmm. But Awesome Kong's moving here. Yeah, and in this particular event, Awesome Kong is, I don't know, with Wild Hair taking it out the night, the previous round, you could say probably, well, maybe Wild Hair was the fastest truck on premise. Problem is, is that truck broke. So that title eventually will go down to Awesome Kong, as far as I'm concerned. And Kong also being the truck that has lane choice, has the lane advantage on everybody the entire night. I mean, it seems like it's going to go Steve Kane's way. Yeah, you know, we, we go to the interview after the race, and Steve tells Mike Goss straight up, he feels he has the fastest truck, and he can win. Yeah, and now that Wild Hair is out, and he's still in, it's, it's it's a fair statement for him to make. We scroll to the next race, though, in the second semifinal, Carolina Crusher and King Crunch. Uh, uh, I mean, this is kind of a, a rivalry that nobody really, really talks about from 89 and 90. These two trucks squared off quite a bit. They're both square body Chevrolets. They're both fast Chevrolets. And, I mean, staying consistent is part of it, and that's what Gary does right here. And it seems like there's a lot of problems going on with King Crunch in that other lane. Yeah, I mean, they come off the first set of cars, and Gary's already got a little bit of a lead. Scott's not going to give up. He's putting it to the floor, and, and we hear the RPMs go through the roof again, and then the smoke starts pouring out. Yeah, you see white smoke pouring out of the truck. Uh, that's usually a dead giveaway for a transmission issue. Uh, if there was a little bit of blue mixed in with it, that'd be your engine issue. But no, this is more of a pure white that comes out of the uh, King Crunch truck here, and that's what causes the issue for them. And it se- it's, to me, I thought maybe torque converter was what was causing this because it just doesn't seem like the truck wants to go. Yeah, he runs out of speed pretty quick, and it's interesting, before the race happens, Stan says, you know, Carolina Crusher has been very consistent, he's he's a consistent truck on the tour, and then Rich kind of says, well, Gary's been having a lot of problems with this new truck after running smooth last year, um, but, you know, we that know in hindsight. You, it kind of leaves you scratching your head, you're like, wait, it, they just complimented him, and then Rich is like, no, he's had problems. And and what problems did he have? You know, he, yeah, point me out the problems won. that he had earlier in the season, and I'll be glad to eat my foot. But here, he's not having any problems. Yeah, Gary won the last week in Lima, and yeah. made it to the finals the other night. So I'm not sure where this, you know, these truck issues are coming from. That that's something that really confused me with Rich's commentary. He seemed to kind of just throw things in, you know, where they, where they didn't credit, really make to his sense. Credit though, this is one of his early TV broadcast appearances. So maybe he's, he's just not quite there yet. He's not putting two and two together as far as some uh, some things out there. That happens with people that are new to a TV portion. 
Well, and you've got Rich as an insider, you know, yeah. so maybe he's referring to stuff that we didn't get to see on TV. You know, yes. they, they weren't racing on TV every week. So, you know, maybe Gary really did just get it together for those TV shows and for the points races. And maybe at some fairgrounds elsewhere, he was having some trouble. Could very well have been, and that could have been what Rich was speaking to, but he doesn't really elaborate right here, and that's something that I wished he would have done. Eh, yeah, you know, half hour show, you got to make it work, right? Yeah, I guess so. I wish it was <laughs> live, but anyway. <laughs> Finals, Awesome Kong, Carolina Crusher. This is, in my opinion, one of the coolest matchups you could have as far as a final round goes for a venue that you're running for really the first time for TNT, if I remember correctly. Uh, Kong and Crusher is just a cool race regardless. Yeah, Steve Kane, Awesome Kong, comes in through the loser bracket, so you've got that storyline. And uh, I don't Rich, I don't know if I'd necessarily call it a loser bracket, though. He's coming back for the break rule. In, uh, in yeah, sense. yeah, yeah, we'll call it the break rule. And, and uh, Rich is saying that Awesome Kong's got the horsepower, but Carolina Crusher's got the experience in his corner. So, you know, despite the fact that they're not very excitable on the microphone, they are laying out some good storylines here. And, uh, you know, as we come over the first set of cars, it comes down to that exit again off that first ramp. And, and that's, yeah, what, and the that's difference what costs is. Carolina Crusher the win. A little bit of a bounce on the right front causes Gary to go a little nose high, and that's all that it takes. And Steve Kane goes on to cruise to victory in Bowling Green, Ohio. And, and Gary's pushing it hard over the second set. We don't see that truck get out of shape a lot. But uh, he's correcting in no man's land, trying to get the truck back straight from that bad bounce. And he launches and he only ends up, you know, what, two, three truck lengths behind at the end. Yeah, and he, he was, was about it. five truck lengths behind at that point, and he gains back quite a bit on Kong. Yeah, so, I mean, Gary's pushing it hard and, and gets the truck a little bit out of shape over the finish line. But it, uh, it ends up being awesome Kong, the winner here today. Steve says the new Profab transfer case is working very well, and you learn something new every time he gets behind the wheel of the truck. Yeah, and, you know, we have to look at it through the lens that we have today. The new drivers back then, you were learning as you went in each show, so you're learning every time you get in the truck. And not to say that the folks don't now, but in reality, most of these newer drivers are getting more wheel time before their first show than these guys did in a season back then. Exactly. I mean, nowadays, practice is a thing. Yeah, between practice and, and what they've got going on at Monster Jam University, you're not going out and learning by doing necessarily anymore. You're still obviously going to learn every time you get in the truck, but that steep learning curve is taken care of before you're in front of the crowd, which is a good thing, and it helps the you know the product for the fans. Yeah, I mean, you want if you're going to have somebody brand new in a truck, you want to have a little bit of seat time with that people. In these early days, though. The only seat time you would probably get is if uh, the owner of the truck would throw a new driver in and say, hey, there's a load of crush cars in the backyard. Go crush them. That might be the only seat time a driver would get. That's not the same experience as what you would get in, say, Bowling Green, Ohio, in this particular racetrack. Yeah, and that was if you were lucky. You know, a lot of times it was like, oh, we can't make this show or somebody got injured. You're in the truck tonight. Yep, and that happens. We saw uh, the best example I can think of off the top of my head was Dave Morris when he left Equalizer after, uh, I believe it was Roanoke in 1990. The second day after he wins and Dennis runs into the side of him, he's nowhere to be seen the next day, and Mike Wine suddenly has to jump into that truck. Yeah, I mean, they had nobody to fill the seat, and uh, I think Gary Cook ran a couple shows in between before he got Greg Holbrook on board, but it's uh, you know you take all hands on deck at that point. Yeah. Show number two, though, we get a new challenger coming into the place, and we touched on it earlier at the beginning of this show. Taurus number three is going to be in this uh, particular race here, and this is one of the first times we see this truck on television. And in the qualifying pass that they show here, it, may, it might be as qualifying, it might be as buy from round one, I'm not sure. But the truck looks really good, aside from a little bit of a rear end bounce in the truck. Oh, man. Taurus three, what a machine. You know, the, the truck's still pretty new at this point. It's only been out for about two months. You know, we're talking, what, mid-June, mid-late June here. And yeah. uh, the truck had debuted in April at Arrowhead Stadium in Kansas City. So um, they're still getting the suspension kind of figured out. And, you know, again, learning as they go at each show. They've got bookings. They've got to make the truck work. And, and they did get to test the truck a little bit before it debuts. But, um, you know, they're... 
they're running a little bit rough compared to how the truck would handle in the future. You know, the shock technology is very new. Uh, Jack wouldn't really say, you know, who was making the shocks because they didn't, you know, if they didn't work, he didn't want to, you know, give anybody a bad reputation. And mm -hmm. um, what, what's interesting is, you know, in seeing some of the, the Taurus DVD that, that Chris Parrish helped put together and, and some other footage shown at the Hall of Fame, Taurus ran with TNT a, a good bit, uh, just not on television. Sometimes even have two trucks at one show. Yeah, and this was, the only, I believe, the only time we ever saw Taurus on a TNT broadcast. And Taurus does extremely good here. The one thing, one thing that we need to, we need to touch on it because it's perfect product placement is the post honeycomb sponsorship and the wheel covers that they have on Taurus here. It's, it's just cool. I love it. It's perfect. Oh, it's so good. I mean, it somebody like with a, a, it looks like four giant honeycombs on the truck. Somebody with a marketing degree, uh, you know, earned their their paycheck coming up with that idea because it, it just makes sense and uh, a cool commercial too on top of it. Yeah, a very cool commercial. Uh, something that stands out on Awesome Kong as well for the second show is the fact that it now has a big sponsorship on the side from BG Motorcycle Accessories. Uh, like you said in your notes, and like I thought originally when I saw this, was it's likely a local sponsor who saw the win the previous night and thought, no, but no, it would probably be a good idea if I threw that logo on there. I might get it in front of a couple thousand eyes out here. Yeah, you know, that that's something that happens in motorsports. And uh, for those of you that watch NASCAR, I mean, Guys like Norm Benning going to the track every week and, and picking up sponsors at the racetrack. It's still something that happens today, and uh, you know it's 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 a good thing. You know, people want to get their product or, or their service out there. You put it on the side of a racing vehicle, get it in front of the fans. Yeah, uh, one thing that this made me think of, as far as local sponsors go, uh, there was a race. I believe it was at Bristol in NASCAR, and I know I'm going off a NASCAR tangent here. But I remember, I think it was Bubba Wallace in the 43 car had a McDonald's logo on the hood, and he was being passed by Kyle Larson in the number 42 McDonald's sponsorship. The difference between the two is Bubba's sponsorship was a local McDonald's corporation that got their, their little people together and put their logo on the car, whereas the corporate sponsor was on the 42 car that weekend with Kyle Larson. Yeah, it kind of harkens back to what we were talking about with the Coors deal earlier. Yeah. You know, Coors had a multi million dollar investment in USA Motorsports and Scott Stevens and, and Pablo and their team uh, to build trucks, sponsor the events. Uh, later on with Dan Patrick running the, the extra gold and the Keystone brands as well. I mean, it was a multi year, multi million dollar agreement, but. I'm guessing here a local distributor or somebody gets involved and, and sponsors the show. So it's, it's kind of a similar situation. We look back and we, I just want to go back to this Taurus qualifying run really fast. And you, you see, well, qualifying by run, whatever they showed right here, just impressive to look at. It, it almost looks like Jackie's like three quarters of a throttle. Maybe he doesn't seem like he's full boogaloo on the pass. Yeah, he's, he's not pushing it that hard, but uh, 7.42 second qualifying time, that's your top qualifier for the night. Yeah, something that's interesting here is, is TNT wasn't running, I don't believe, a weight limit yet. No, you know, and Taurus is running at what? I think you said 7,800 pounds. Somewhere in that in that range, and, and TNT had no need for a weight limit yet. Uh, Until they saw this more. truck, I think, and then they were like, wait a minute. Well, Equalizer was light. I think I've heard some people tossing around that it was under 10,000 pounds, and, and I can believe it. The truck reacted as such. But, uh, you know, Taurus was 7,800, 7,900 pounds, somewhere in there, but they were still running steel wheels. The truck was mm -hmm. initially meant to run a set of aluminum wheels that sit on the truck now at the International Monster Truck Hall of Fame. And Marty verified this with me, Marty Garza. He said the truck was somewhere in the neighborhood – of like 6,900 pounds with that wheel and tire combination, which is just a tremendously light vehicle um, for this kind of application. And uh, if, you, if you have a chance to get up to, to Butler, Indiana for the Hall of Fame, uh, this weekend is the grand opening. I'll be there. Come say hi to me and uh, check out the Taurus 3 machine that we're talking about. Yeah, you'll get to see this truck that's literally competing at this event right here, live and in person this coming weekend. Always happy to plug the International Motorsports Museum Hall of Fame. Actually, excuse me, I say that and I realize it's now the International Monster Truck Hall of Fame. They've moved to Butler, Indiana, their own building with their own uh, memorabilia that's going to be into it. They put a lot of work into this venue, and I, I would love to be there this weekend. Unfortunately, I'm racing uh, RC, RC duties. <laughs> 
But like I said, Matt's going to be on the sh- Matt's on the show this Friday. Say hi to him when you see him up there. Matt's a really good representative for this bo- podcast as well as old school monster trucks in general, and he's a great conversation. Say hi and get the man's autograph too. Oh boy, you're putting the pressure on me now. I'm going to have to practice my signature. Yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> if so, you so sign what- five autographs, I'll have you on the show next week too. Oh man, you've heard it, guys <laughs> and gals. Let's make it happen. <laughs> One last point about Taurus here. You know, this is June of 1989. Bigfoot 8 still being fabricated at this yeah. point. They're not even yeah, in that's... testing yet. One thing I put in my notes here is a lot of people like to consider Bigfoot 8 the first of these these Stage 3 monster trucks, and they are wrong in that statement. Equalizer is kind of a bridge between Stage 2 and Stage 3. I've always considered Taurus to be your first Stage 3 truck. And, and Jack didn't design the truck. Um, you know, he, he paid David Cook, I believe yeah. his name was, to design the chassis for him. And obviously, David did a good job. We still see traces of that design today uh, in the men's camp and, and some other folks that are running similar chassis. And it's yeah, a everybody simple. Everybody calls that the Wilman chassis, but it's yeah. more of the Cook chassis. It's a simple, good, strong design uh, that's efficient. And, uh, you know, it's one of the big three, I call them catalyst trucks. That, that changes the industry in 1989, you know, Equalizer debuts in late 88 uh, and continues to go through an evolution throughout the next number of years. Taurus 3 debuts, takes it a step further, and, and Bigfoot 8 comes in with some even more radical technology uh, later in the year come fall when it actually debuts for the public. But um, it, it, there are three and tremendously important vehicles in the sports history. We've got Equalizer at the Hall of Fame now, Taurus 3, and boy, Bigfoot 8 being restored by Bigfoot 4x4 in Pacific, Missouri. Boy, I hope we get to see those three trucks sitting next to each other. Yeah, I mean, that's that's your evolution of monster trucks right there. That's the three trucks that everybody looked at in 89 and tried to not necessarily copy, but tried to beat for a number of years afterwards. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we say the Taurus wasn't here the first night. The best I can figure, and these are some dates that I got, you know, from our colleagues, uh, Chris Parrish and and Nick Davis were helping me Mm -hmm. out with some background info uh, on this show. Um, The dates they had were a Saturday and a Sunday night, which is a bit odd for a monster truck show, but stranger things have happened. And it would explain why Jackie shows up for this second show. He probably like they were just passing through. He probably had a show somewhere else Friday and Saturday and, you know, wild hair's out. As far as I can tell, not in the lineup tonight due to the uh, the transfer case getting blown out of the truck. So they may have called him in on short notice. Yeah, they, pro- they probably did. They call him in on short notice. And I'm sure whenever they see the Wilman hauler pulling in, there are a lot of guys out there that might have heard of the truck. Some guys might not have even seen it yet. But I'm sure that the people that knew about that truck probably looked at it and went, well, all right, we're racing for second. <laughs> well, you know, for a lot of the guys, it's the first time seeing the truck. Uh, I think yeah. a few of them allude to it later in some interviews, but uh, we go down to Mike Goss talking with Jackie, kind of introducing the fans at home to Taurus and this new truck. Jackie saying that, you know, this is built for racing. It's very light, and, and they're hoping to do well with it. Yep, and that's exactly what they're going to do here. Uh, first round matchup, though, we see Taurus get a buy. I'm assuming that's because we do have one truck out of the lineup here, and that is Wild Hair. Uh, no problem, and Mr. Twister actually lead us off. And it should be a fairly close matchup here with two similar-looking trucks. No problem, though, with that Bigfoot motor. Gains an advantage between the first and second set of cars. Very short truck length, but still takes a victory by about that very short truck length. Yeah, you know, both trucks really kind of top out before hitting the second set here. We saw Mr. Twister going so strong the night before. And, and the truck's still working good, but uh, he doesn't really gain the speed over the second set of cars like we saw the first night. And he closes in a little bit on no problem, about a truck length, a very short truck length victory for John Moore. But, uh, you know, a good race overall, I feel. Yeah, I still I think it was a very good race. It showcased these two trucks very nicely. Uh, to me, the Mr. Twister truck is just one of the coolest looking trucks out of the 80s. Wished it would have got a win at one point during this weekend, but boy, it really showed that it with a little bit of extra work, maybe it could be a contender out there. It's a good run, good showing here from Christensen. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, you know, you and I are both into RC racing. I don't know if anybody's ever done a Mr. Twister truck. Barry has. I can remember. Okay. So, Barry uh, has, and I believe that it's currently in possession of Jamie Grund. Oh, good deal. Well, hopefully Jamie will get that thing out to race with us soon because uh, I'd love to see it in person. 
Yep. Uh, Carolina Crusher versus Stomper. First thing that jumped out into my head and made me chuckle was Rich Hoosier's statement that his mom's from North Carolina and Carolina Crusher is one of her favorites. You know, boy, Rich just knows everybody. You know, he's, I think I think he talks on one point in the episode like somebody's their neighbor or, you know, somebody it's it's interesting to see the inside information. Um, you know, it's a small world. Everybody kind of knows each other. It's a small world after all. <laughs> <laughs> Carolina Crusher, though, is going to run away with the victory on this one. Easy win starting. I mean, Crusher is just very smooth out of the gate in that left lane. Uh, right lane just causing all sorts of problems for Stomper. He's bouncing to the left, bouncing to the right, rear end of the truck, never under control at all for Marvin as Carolina Crusher just smooth as smooth silk going on to the finish line. Yeah, and again, kind of backing off a little bit, save the equipment like we, we talked about earlier. And uh, we go into the next race, King Crunch versus Mad Dog. Somehow, the folks in the production truck spell King Crunch wrong only on this episode. Well... It's spelled, we'll put it this way, it's spelled correctly, but it's spelled wrong for the truck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and it goes through the whole show. Yeah, and they do this the complete wrong way throughout the whole show. King Crunch, obviously, they spell it with a, K, a C instead of a K. Uh, first show, they did this correctly. Second show, they were like, no, we're just going to go ahead and mess with it. Yeah, I mean, TV production in the in the 80s, I mean, what can we say? We, we've seen worse faux pas with Dill Wilson and Jerry Porter and Wayne's however Mosanial. many others. Uh, Wayne Smozanic, the poor guy, nobody ever got his name right for a while. Uh, one thing in this race that jumped out, and obviously it should jump out because it's just incredibly high-sounding RPM out of King Crunch. Mad Dog gets the whole shot, but for somehow King Crunch, even sounding the way that it does, just revving to the moon, sounds like it's stuck in second gear. Goes on to steal the win at the very last second for Mad Dog here. A great come from behind victory for Scott Stevens. He, he flies past him in the air, and, and you see the smoke start to pour out of King Crunch again. Um, you know, right after the finish line, we'll, we'll see how that affects him. Scott says that it seems like they were going to blow the head gaskets out of the truck. Well, once the transmission works right, it'll be all right. I'm guessing, just like you did, that the truck just doesn't want to go into third gear. Yeah, a lot of guys were running three speeds at the time. So, uh, you know, you get those first two, you can at least get down the track. But not having high gear is definitely a handicap. Yeah, and it's also the second time King Crunch wins out of that right lane, which is considered the bad lane this entire weekend. There's a lot of victories that kind of get stolen away, and this is one of them. Because nobody really, I don't think that Mad Dog really expected King Crunch to run that hard, even though the truck was obviously, it's not 100%, but it still comes back and steals the win with that top end speed. Yeah, I mean, Scott's the only one that can, I'm not even going to say that he figured out the right lane, but he's he's really one of the only he guys just, to he, win. He got the good bounce. Yeah. USA 1 and Nightlife. Rich says that USA 1 usually wins, but Dave Wysorek won't be intimidated. Uh, I don't know why, but for some reason I thought of Dale Earnhardt on this pass. <laughs> just from the intimidated statement. Well, if there is an intimidator, it's Rod Litzow. Again, the stone-faced killer going out trying to, to put everybody to the wall, and he doesn't back off in this race. Oh, heck no. Nightlife has no chance in this race. USA won, looking as strong as ever, even though after the race they say that they're still working on the carburetors and they think by one more run they're going to have it ready to go. And if, I don't know what their definition of ready to go is, but USA won was ready to go on this pass. Yeah, the, the trucks absolutely move, and, and it takes what I call the Litzau bounce after the second set of cars. Um, it happens a lot you know, throughout the season where the, the truck almost clears the cars and kind of gets tripped up a little bit. And Raw just stays on power and, and pulls it out as the truck's getting twisted out of control. Uh, yeah, I mean, he sometimes, pretty much has to at that point, though. Yeah, I mean, the truck's kind of narrow. And you see what happens when Rod has a problem in Buffalo a few weeks later. He's only running a rear-wheel drive. He can't pull the truck out, and the thing goes over. So mm -hmm. Rod is really, really using his experience to, to his advantage here and, and pulling the truck out uh, when probably some others wouldn't and make get the truck into trouble. Yeah, that Litzau bounce is always one that always got me. He'd bounce it up onto the nose a little bit, and it always seemed like the left front would want to grab before the right front. And you just see the flags flailing in the background. It's a classic USA one pose, as you could put it. Oh, yeah. The, the thing flew beautiful through the air. And, and it always seemed to list kind of one side or the other. But, uh, you know, for as hard as he was running, it's impressive that Rod was able to pull the truck out more often than not. 
go to a segment right here that shows a uh, different side of monster truck racing, really. We see the differences between the monster trucks. The long and the short wheelbase, and they specifically mention no problem in Carolina Crusher. They talk about the engine being front and rear. They talk about Wild Hair's motor being in the rear of the truck. And then at the very end of it, they have to mention the, the awesome Kong truck, and by narrowing the truck, which would eventually become something that uh, has been picked up by the Bounty Hunter team recently as well. Uh, the last few years, you've seen a very very low-to-the-ground, very narrow Bounty Hunter truck. Yeah, I mean, the, the truck just works. Um, you know, Jeff, I, I can't remember the exact story. I apologize. It wasn't in my notes to talk about, but he ended up um, making the choice to cut the truck apart on his own. Jeff Dane did. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if, if the truck got up on two wheels one time and they got scared and said, we can't, you know, have this truck like this anymore, but they ended up cutting the cage off the top of the truck and, and redoing it. But, um, you know, that's that narrow, that narrow body on awesome Kong was a real advantage for whoever was driving well, because they could see you had a whole lot better. Oh, better visibility. You could, I'm not sure if they ran a Lexan floorboard or not, but you could probably see the tires somewhat, uh, depending on what angle you were at. And the truck had so much less weight up high that it was a lot more stable. So, I mean, it, from a racing perspective, it really, really works. And, uh, you know, it's something that obviously you're going to point out every time you're on a TV broadcast because the truck's just so unique. Yeah. And, uh, and that, that little that segment was... that, that, that was going to be my next point right there was about Awesome Kong. Uh, had they run a conventional style body on this truck with the name Awesome Kong on the side, I don't think it would be as well remembered as it is for this skinny truck. Uh, probably not as well remembered and, and I dare say probably less successful. Yeah, I would agree to that too. Uh, awesome Kong's out next here though, and it's going to be taking on Black Stallion. Uh, first thing that I see in your notes is Mike has the sunroof open, and it's something I never even noticed until looking at this racing back and forth after reading your notes. I was like, oh yeah, it does have a sunroof. Hey, Mike's always riding in style. <laughs> awesome Kong takes the lead over the first set, but loses power in no man's land and still just rolls to the victory. That tells you how much of a disadvantage Mike Vodders had that weekend. The truck just didn't have any top end speed on it. And uh, Kong just kind of just slowly rolls past the finish line to steal the win. Yeah, I mean, he literally coasts across the finish line. And, and Mike's charging. He's coming back hard, um, trying to take the win. He, he wasn't going to give up. But, you know, Kane barely, barely holds on. Yep, and it's almost uh, almost a little bit bittersweet maybe for the guys in the Breen camp because the night before they go out racing Awesome Kong, defeating him, then the next night Kong goes out winning a race but is not going to be able to come back to do anything else. The truck is damaged beyond repair. They believe they've thrown a piston out. Yeah, he says something in the engine, you know, after that locked up, and, and I think he said he was even having a little bit of trouble before the race started. So it's... You know, you go out and run, they're running for points, they're running for, for payout, and uh, if you don't come to line, you don't get that round money, so... Yeah, and it's a, it's a little bit of a shame, too, because they picked up that local sponsorship, they ran really good the night before, and then the first pass, they go out here, and they're done. And it's, it appears they were as the second fastest qualifier as well, because this is the last pairing that we see before going into round number two. Yeah, and, you know, it's... a. It, it's an unfortunate circumstance for Awesome Kong to be out of the competition that early, but, uh, you know, don't worry, BG Motorcycle Accessories. You guys got some good TV time anyway. Yeah, you definitely did, and we're talking about you 32 years later, so if you're still in business, there's a shout-out. There you go. I should have checked and seen if they were in business still. <laughs> Round number two starts here with Taurus and no problem. No contest, as far as I'm concerned, on paper between these two trucks, and that's exactly what this is. It's a blowout for Taurus. Rich tries to stay positive and say that no problem keeps right there with him. But when you look at the rate, this race itself, Taurus gets a lead. Taurus knows it has a lead and Jack Jr. Just kind of backs out a little bit and no problem does come back. But I think it's due to the fact that uh, the right foot kind of got a little less heavy in the, in the uh, left lane. Yeah. And I mean, John doesn't have a bad run for the right lane either. I mean, he, gets no, he, a does. he has bounce. an excellent run. He has a decent bounce downsides the first set, but you know, you're running, maybe probably what 13 13 and a half thousand pounds on the no problem machine and the other trucks half of that mm -hmm. you know so it's uh you know when you put physics into play one's going to end up on the on the good end and it's Taurus's time yep uh, and the truck that is built over in Granite City Illinois moves on to the semifinal round Carolina Crusher and Nightlife is the next pair 
Uh, they've raced each other now the three times this weekend. This is the first time they're racing in day number two. Uh, the first set of the cars is again showing to be that a determining factor is nightlife pops the rear end up over the first set of cars, and that is all that is needed for Gary Porter in this race. Man, poor Dave Wysork just couldn't get a break the whole weekend. He's he's getting beat by, you know, a truck length, half a truck length in a bad lane repeatedly by the same guy. Mm -hmm. I'm, sure he, I'm sure he could not wait to get out of Bowling Green, Ohio. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he couldn't wait to get out either. Uh, Gary Porter, his, I found his interview interesting here. Gary is asked by Mike Goss, who's the truck to beat? And you could almost see Gary just smirk and almost roll his eyes just a little bit at that question because it's obvious the truck to beat. Well, I mean, Gary was generally a pretty humble guy on yeah. the on the camera, but he says, you know, Taurus and USA one are fast, but Crusher's the one to beat. Yeah, but it it as soon as he gets asked that question, he you can almost see that he just wanted to say Taurus. Well, you know, you get you can't sell yourself short, I guess, when the cameras yeah, are on. You can't sell yourself short when cameras are on, but just <laughs> the body language and the way that he almost rolls his eyes, you're almost certain he's just gonna he wants to say, Yeah, it's gonna be Taurus. <laughs> ah, we'll see if Crusher and Taurus match up at later tonight. See who can uh, put well, the medal. That's the pair. To the that's the pair for the semifinals. There we go. Mister Twister though is next, and in for King Crunch, who is broken, unfortunately. Mad Dog comes out next as well to take on Mister Twister. Mad Dog gets ahead, but Twister comes back on the second set. Mad Dog's going to hold on for the win, but man, that crooked bounce that John Breen got really brought Christensen back into this race. And Christensen still just pushing it as hard as he can. And if you look real carefully over the second set of cars, Christensen lands so hard that he completely blows the hay bale out of the crush car with the front uh, housing of the truck. Yeah, I mean, he, he lands hard. <laughs> He landed extremely hard. Um, what really, really caught my eye on this race was just how close the finish was. Mad Dog gets onto the cars, doesn't get much air, lands onto the cars, and really Breen has to stand on it at that point and run across the cars with just the left sides on the sides of the cars. Right, and in 1989, TNT had already instituted the 2-2 two and two rule, so good for John to be cognizant of that and keep the truck on the cars, and uh, it, it probably – you know, would not have had the win. Otherwise, he'd have been disqualified. Yep. Black Stallion coming in for Awesome Kong, another truck that's broken here, taking on USA 1. This one, I mean, in every sense of the word, should be a blowout, and that's exactly what it is. Unfortunate for Mike Vodders, but, man, Rod Litzow is just on his game right now. Rod's pushing it again. I mean, he does take it easy over the second set, and uh, I don't want to speak for Mike, but it kind of looks like he gave up at the starting line. Yeah, and in this race, this is one that I kind of circled and I had a little bit of a question mark by, not for who was going to win. It was it was obvious to me when I saw the pairing who was going to win unless there was breakage. Uh, what really caught me was is the fact that Rod didn't take this opportunity to change the lane that he was going to be in. Because it seems like he's on a collision course later in the show. It, just, it feels like he's on the, the pace to take on Taurus in the final. Let's just be fair to that. You know, that's a good point. I hadn't noticed that. And uh, if he was going to switch up lanes, that's the time to do it. And, you know, he, he doesn't take that that option. So that's that's a, a very, very good point. If I'm Rod Litzow, I'm probably going in the right lane for that race. Yeah, I mean, to me, I would want to have a shot in that other lane, knowing full well that the number one qualifier is going to take the lane that I'm used to using. Just flat out, plain and simple. Oh, for sure. And and we would see Dennis Anderson do this a lot in later years, where if he had a, a what we'd call an easy, you know, first round matchup, if he had lane choice, he'd go in the bad lane on purpose just to get a feel for it and see what was up. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're still kind of early in the racing game here. I'm not sure if it was just a matter of make sure you get to the next round. Um, Rod is, I don't know if he's playing a little bit of theater with these engine problems or if they're legitimately having an issue still. Uh, you know, he's saying that, you know, the carbs are still an issue. They're going to have to keep trying. It looks like the truck is pretty much 100% to me. Yeah, it looks like it's 100% to me, but we do hear Mike Goss say something about black smoke out of the bottom of the engine whenever they're firing it. And I, I don't know, maybe maybe that's just running a little bit rich with that. I'm not sure. But uh, they keep playing up a motor issue with USA1 on the second day for sure. Yeah, those Predator carburetors are basically an on-off switch for what I understand. You've got mm -hmm. kind of a low range, mid range, and high end with the triple carburetor set up, and, and that's how they tuned them. Um, I'm not a mechanic for monster trucks myself. That's just kind of how I understood it to be, but uh, I'm sure that they required a lot of attention. 
Yeah, they, they had to, especially with the power that they were pushing through the USA one truck at this time. Semi-final round, though, is going to start right here. We got Taurus and Carolina Crusher. I mean, you look at this on paper, you're obviously going to say Taurus. But, man, this race just kind of speaks to old school and new school technology and where the sport was headed, in all honesty. Yeah, I mean, it's impressive to see a truck like Taurus going up against Carolina Crusher. And, you know, he's kind of out of the throttle by half track. Yeah, he's out of the throttle by half track, and you can see Gary pushing it to try to catch back up to him, but it just doesn't happen. Taurus goes on to take the win and goes straight to the finals, and up to this point, they have not had to push that Taurus truck at all. No, I mean, Jackie's taking it easy. He's he's absolutely on rails tonight, as he often was, and, you know, the truck just works so well. Um, you know, when he had to push it, he did, but we see here he's he's kind of saving some a little bit. Yeah, and after the race, we see Mike Goss ask Jackie about uh, basically being on a collision course, possibly with USA 1 in the finals. Jack Jr. just says he hopes that he's going to get the whole shot in the finals, and I don't think he has to worry about that because he's got the good lane. Yeah, he's saying That's that, that first jump. Yeah, he's saying the first jump's important, uh, you know, which is something obviously that we've been, you know, making sure that is well known here as well. So it's nice to see that, you know, Jackie was cognizant of that as well, coming in right there as it was happening. Mad Dog in USA won second semifinal. Uh, Rich says that both these trucks have a lot of horsepower. I would throw a ton of horsepower in the USA one side. I'm not I'm not 100% sure what's in Mad Dog, but I don't think it's anywhere near the power that we see out of that USA one Chevrolet on the other side. Yeah, he's got a decent engine, but nothing like, uh, like what the USA one team was running. So uh, obviously way outpowered. And, um, you know, both trucks kind of get a little bit out of shape in no man's land. I'm not sure... You know what happens with John? It looks like he's trying to correct, but then he just kind of bails on the second set of cars because he's behind, and and Rod goes on. Yeah, Rod goes on to take the win here. Uh, I mean, when you look at both of these passes side by side, you see where the narrowness of USA One kind of helps it a little bit because it's a lot less of a correction that he has to make inside the cab to get that truck to stay straight. Whereas Mad Dog, it's bouncing all over the place. It's a little bit wider of a wheel width. And it just throws the truck off to the left, and he misses the second set of cars. First truck to really miss the cars the entire weekend. Yeah, I mean, you know, Mad Dog doesn't have a ton of suspension travel either. It's a very, very early race truck design. Yeah. It's kind of like driving a concrete slab out there on the racetrack. You never know which way it's going to bounce. Rod's interviewed after this race right here, and he says that uh, he's raced against Tourist in Canada, but this is a new truck, and they're having problems themselves, so he's just going to give his best shot in the final round. Mike says the pulling crowd is going to get a great show for the finals here, USA 1 and Taurus. Yeah, we've got, uh, you know, pretty much what we'd call the two fastest trucks at this point, and, uh, you know, we've got old versus new technology. Uh, USA 1, if you're going by the Marty Garza definition, which is what I subscribe to, it's really a stage one monster truck. It's a factory frame that's been reinforced. It's got five tons with no planetaries, and they're trying to make up for it with just huge horsepower, Yeah, uh, which works most of the time, of course. But it's really an outdated design already come 1989. And you've got Taurus, a stage three truck, tube frame, coilovers, cut tires. Uh, it's it maybe the lightest racing truck in the history of monster truck racing that I know of. And uh, it's an interesting dichotomy between the two trucks, and, and we see how they're going to show up in the finals. Yeah, and whenever I think of USA 1, it, it really is a Stage 1 truck. Uh, to me, I mean, to put it into perspective of some younger people that might be listening to this, have you ever gotten a video game, and the absolute first thing that you do is throw all of your resources into putting as much power into your truck or car or whatever you're playing in this racing game, but you don't work on anything else? That's that's per the, the definition as far as I'm concerned for uh, the USA one truck at this stage. They put a ton of effort into this engine and into the horsepower of this engine and getting that power to the ground. But they don't have anything as far as suspension for the truck in the other lane. Right. I mean, you know, they could only do so much with a factory frame and, and Everett, to his credit, he's trying to please his sponsors. You know, they're sponsored by Chevrolet. They had a huge marketing campaign based on the truck using a stock Chevrolet truck frame. Yes. And, uh, you know, you kind of have to weigh that as it is, too. And, and Everett, you know, wants to to keep the trucks kind of like that and, and in the way that they're built, um, which, to his credit, allows for the, the manufacturing 
um, backing, you know, from the automakers to to have that marketing behind them. It had worked for them up to this point, but the the sport in a very short amount of time would turn in another direction. Uh, unfortunately for Everett. Yep, and I think that when you're looking at that truck in the other lane, in the left lane, the truck's heavily favored to win, the truck that was the number one qualifier, you're seeing the future of the sport right there. Something similar to that is about to come the next year, and everybody's going to be very upset about it, which is another point to make, too. Not a lot of people, and, and I don't think anybody really, throws a fit over Taurus being in this field. I mean, if they did, they didn't publicize it. Yeah, they didn't know, publicize I... it at all. They didn't talk about it in interviews or anything. But you could almost, like in that Gary Porter interview, you could almost see just a little bit of, not necessarily anger, but the body language just kind of shows you that he's not too happy about that truck being there. Well, I mean, if you've seen that truck perform, you've got to feel defeated kind of up front. You know, that, that thing is working so well. It's so light and it's so fast. How do you compete with it with the equipment that they had at the time? You know, um, these guys are starting to think about building new trucks, uh, but uh, one man operation like Gary Porter, it takes a long time. You know, yeah. it would take him a full year to get Carolina Crusher three on the road from at least from where we're sitting right now. You know, it would debut in July of 1990. So um, I'm sure the gears are starting to turn for some of these guys that, hey, if we're going to stay competitive with this point series, we're going to have to you know, do some R and D and, and step our program up. Yep. And I mean, th this race right here is pure power versus suspension ingenuity right here. And the suspension ingenuity is what wins this race flat out and flat out Taurus. Like I said, fastest qualifier all night long, never really had to push the truck. What wins the race for Taurus is the fact that it is down and away off the first set of cars while USA one is still in the air at this point over the first set of cars. And when USA one lands, it bounces hard on the front end, pops the nose up a little bit. And that is all that it took for Taurus to scoot on by and in its hardest pass of the night, take the victory. Yeah. I mean, it, it did not get a good bounce for Litzau. Um, again, maybe he'd have known a little better had he tried that right lane earlier. That was my um, We saw a race earlier and I, I didn't mention it in my notes, which one it was, but somebody really attacked that first set of cars hard and really it didn't work for him. Uh, it threw the truck up in the air on the launch ramp, and it, it's a testament to these guys to see the, how easy they were taking it over the first set of cars to try to drive across them and, and get the speed up. Um, you know, the truck bounced too hard. Uh, the race was basically uncontested from that point on. So, you know, Taurus is your winner. Yep, Taurus is the winner on the night. Day two in Bowling Green, Ohio. Rod says after the race is over with that he believes that he pushed the truck to the limit and the motor actually went in the final round. I don't know about that personally, but I mean, it just, it was a no contest. As soon as he hit the cars and bounced up, the race was done. Taurus goes on to take the win and they closed the show by showing the truck, signing some autographs, uh, slow, slow motion of the final round as well. Uh, just a really cool broadcast i thought i really enjoyed this second day i enjoyed the first day but i enjoyed the second day a little bit more yeah i mean uh, and i sound like a broken record here you know it really is a decent show for for something that not a lot of people will necessarily have seen uh it's not a show that i know that people talk about all the time in our circles of of the you know vintage monster truck guys but it was a pretty good overall program yep it was and this event overall really shows a preview of what was going to come later in 89 with Equalizer, as well as what was going to come with the new wave of trucks in 1990, of course, with the Taurus 3 truck sitting here on the track. It almost puts a what if out there. Of what if Taurus had ran TNT in 1990? Would it have been a different result in the point series? Would it have been a more Bigfoot 8 Taurus broadcast that we would be hearing about more than Bigfoot 8 and Equalizer or Bigfoot 8 and King Crunch? Where would Taurus have stacked up in 1990? That is a question that is unfortunately never going to be answered, but it's one that you can possibly think about quite a bit. Yeah, it comes up often here on the Retro Monster Truck Review. What if Barefoot had run a lot of TNT with his big yeah. engine? What, what if, if Excalibur, Excalibur had ran an 88? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of good trucks that unfortunately we didn't get to see go up against each other a lot. Uh, Taurus 3 in TNT all year. Oh, man, what an entertaining show that would have been. No, oh, yeah. Now, I love the what if questions. And I know a lot of people are, they'll sit back and they'll think, oh man, but it, it never happened. But it's cool to think about what if it had happened. And that's why I bring it up right here. 
Think of 1990 if you've got Taurus 3, Bigfoot 8, and Equalizer racing each other. Where would the competition have been that weekend? Because obviously it would have been a three-truck battle to the finish instead of a two-truck battle. Yeah, you know, we'd see a little bit of that in 1991 on on the outdoor season with Penda. But, Mm -hmm. boy, those indoor tracks would have been an absolute blast with all these four-link trucks racing against each other. I agree. And it would have put a lot of guys a little bit more of a competitive advantage towards them as well had they done that and then went into the 91 season and you get into these really long competitive tracks that Penda put out. It would have gave some guys a little bit more uh, to put in that notebook. Oh, for sure. I think it would have moved the evolution even faster because, you know, Gary's probably going to get his truck done faster. Dennis had been working on Gravedigger 3. I'm not sure exactly when he started, but he was talking about a new truck in like early 1990 that he was already working on. So it took him a long time to get Digger 3 done. It didn't debut till like November. Yeah, and um, he built he built Digger 2 and he was already talking about Digger 3. Yeah. So, I mean, the guys, like I said, the gears were turning and they were working. It's just a matter of they didn't have necessarily the resources that your Bigfoot and even your Taurus team, which wasn't a big team. You know, it's just a few guys, but they were able to at least have somebody back at the shop, whether it was Eldon or, or somebody else helping out Dave Cook, working on the new trucks while they were out campaigning, campaigning the current ones. Yeah, and Barefoot's another one you could throw in there as well. To me, the top three teams coming out of the late 80s are Bigfoot, Barefoot, and Taurus, and they are all, like I said, within 45 minutes of each other down the road. Uh, it's that nucleus of monster truck history right there in the St. Louis area, and and there's still a lot going on there. Oh, yeah. There's still a lot going on in the St. Louis area. This weekend, though, like I said earlier in the podcast, as well as Matt, International Motorsport or International Monster Truck Hall of Fame. I, I can't get over that hump. I don't know why. The International Monster Truck Hall of Fame is this weekend. They are grand opening the event. There'll be some old school car crushes there. Uh, take some video of it. I really want to see it. I wish I could be there. But Matt will be there. Like I said, give him, make him sign at least five autographs, and then he'll be on the show next week. I promise you. <laughs> I'll give him my best shot. So what, what are we going to score this this weekend, Josh? I scored it a 7 out of 10, uh, mainly because I love the racing, uh, but the broadcast did leave a little bit to be lacked out there. There were a few mistakes by Rich Hoosier on the broadcast. There were a few mistakes by Stan Rhodes as well. I uh, don't want to get nitpicky on it. Uh, the main issue that I had was the camera angle that I had talked about earlier in the show with it not being directly on the finish line. They were just at a little bit of an angle, so there were a couple of races where you're kind of left scratching your head a little bit as to who actually took the win. Yeah, I mean, the production overall, in terms of the video and editing and stuff like that, wasn't too bad. Personally, I'm just not a fan of the commentary team as is. Um, I think that they would tweak and and get that system worked out for for TNN a lot better in the ensuing years. I give the racing easily a solid seven or eight. Uh, The production, I'm going to knock it to like a four at best. The production Um, wasn't there. Um, The the, the other thing that really got me too was the fact that between day one and day two, they did absolutely no track prep on that right lane. It was the exact same as it was the night before. And it really just showed that, I mean, yeah, one or two guys got a win over there, but they could have done a little bit more to bring that lane back to life. Yeah, and, and despite that, we still had some really good racing, and, and I think that's where the, the product really shines here for TNT is those guys went out and ran hard and, and put on a really, really good show, especially for the live crowd. Um, if you've listened to Scott Douglas's podcast, you know a lot of this TV stuff for TNT, they weren't really generating much revenue from it. It was a lot of bought and bartered time. Uh, Mm -hmm. with the networks so they really did live and die by the gate still and unfortunately the industry still kind of works that way um, which is why we see you know monster jam not live on tv Um, they they need the people in those seats to to break a a profit and you know that's no discredit to them that's just how live entertainment works so um, you know overall a, a good show i'd give it probably a five or a six out of ten as the total package Uh, Again, the competition, though, is really better than that. Yeah, I agree. That'll be it for this week's show, though, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, always appreciate those likes and the comments there on YouTube, the subscriptions as well. I really do appreciate the five-star reviews on Apple iTunes. And don't forget to follow us on Spotify. We're growing, we're growing, and we're growing every little bit by every little bit a week. Till then, though, guys, we'll catch you again on the Tracks Across America.